Hi, everybody. I wish I could be there with you today. Um, but instead, I'm sending you a video, and I hope that in doing this that I can share some thoughts uh, on this very urgent and important topic of the future of education. Uh, this is a topic that for me is uh, not only very intellectually stimulating, but is also personally relevant uh, in my own family across generations and also um, in terms of the way we think about evolution itself, the way in which future generations learn to be in their world and the way they adapt to their world, the way they perceive their world, the way that they're able to generate possibilities within their world has everything to do with this crucial, crucial conversation. I think the first mistake that we can make is in thinking that education is something that is in the education system. Uh, uh, the way in which the education system has been shaped and formed and informed by so many other contexts of life makes it a, a piece of a very complex puzzle. But I don't think the solution that we're looking for in education is actually in the school system. And that may seem like a radical thing to say uh, until you start to, to pick it apart a little bit and ask, well, the education system is shaped by the economy and the ideas of what a job could be or how the future of our, our children um, will be subsidized. How will they pay for food and rent? So in a way, the education system and the economy are, are inextricably linked together. The notion of employment, of, of expertise, of the possibilities of, of getting a job after, are, are caught in education. But so is family, right? And so students, children are, they may want to study how to be in a completely different world, but that world is incoherent to their parents and grandparents who want for them the same signifiers of what it is to be successful, monetarily successful, uh, professionally successful, to be respectable in the community. And those signifiers are informed from previous generations. So you're also dealing with family. So that the education system is actually a reflection of the family. But the education system is also an expression of technology and the way in which technology has uh, given rise to how people are communicating, how they are learning, how they are doing research, how they are thinking about even themselves. So the education system is deeply connected to technology. But that's not all. The education system is also about identity. Who are you becoming in the world? Are you the good kid in the algebra class that got all the homework done and got a 100% on the test? Are you the one that didn't get it? Are you the, the funny kid that made jokes in the back of the class? Who are you? What is the identity that you are carrying? And the education system names people gives them titles, gives them place in the world. So education is very concerned with identity. And health. What does it mean to be healthy in an education system? Do we have an education system that can actually nourish the health of the coming generations? 
Um, this is not a, a, a trivial question, as I know probably there have been people already in the conference talking about the crisis um, of young people today in uh, depression, anxiety, suicide rates, uh, various forms of eating disorders, etc. They can't be disconnected from each other. So how can a, uh, an education system provide more possibilities for healthy communities? But it doesn't stop at health either. We're also looking at history and the way that education has been and the research that has taken place will perpetuate the way it continues because that is the tradition and so much of education is about tradition. It's about knowing what happened before, but what happened before is how we got where we are. So here are all these different contexts and I ask now, where is the education system? Is it in history, health, tech, family? Is it in is it in um, technology? If you want to address the education system, where should you go? Is it employment? I sense that this is a difficult question and it needs to be because for too long there have been conferences on how to make a better education system that did not include those other contexts and therefore any significant change was impossible, incoherent, totally abstracted. And it, what keeps happening is we make better curricula or some new experimental pilot program. But then nothing changes because those same students have to go out in the world. They have to take the same tests. They have to go get applications for the same jobs. I have just given a description of education as it is now um, in terms of a, a term that my father coined, and this is the term transcontextual. Transcontextual refers to the way that multiple contexts are coming together to form and inform an entity. Okay, what we're talking about here is complex systems and complex living systems in particular, and that no complex living system exists in just one context. I, as an individual, am my history. I am my family. I'm my technology. I am my economics. I am my microbiome. I'm my culture. I am my health. So looking at the way all of these contexts shape each other gives us an entry point into a completely different approach to tending these matters that are too serious to not be held in the enormity and the paradoxes that they exist within. We cannot shy away from this any longer. So it's transcontextual. And for so long, we have actually been trained to think in terms of metrics, in terms of simplifying a complex situation by which we didn't really mean simplifying, what was meant was reductionism. And so the kind of metrics that formed, formed through a reductionist lens. So you could measure how well someone did in math class but that was no measure of that child. It was no measure of their home life. It was no measure of how they were eating or how their microbiome is thriving. And you may think, but that doesn't matter. We just need to measure math. And what you get is the kind of situations that we have now where it's completely normalized, it's classified, and classifying 
to use these measurements to identify and to create thresholds into which the previous generations, our generations, and the coming generations can be assessed. So I guess my first question for the future of education is what does it look like to have a more substantial understanding of the kind of even mathematics that holds the complexity, that holds multiple variables in play. So that what is being assessed is not a reductionist metric, but another version of how to think about what is a human being and how are we living together. Um, the history behind that is dark. I think I don't need to go too far into it, but the world now is interested in the notions of decolonization. And one of the first aspects of that process is going to be rethinking education. What is knowledge? Who is guarding the knowledge? What does it mean to have the knowledge? Who gets to have the knowledge? Which knowledge? This colonization of knowledge is intrinsically linked with industry and has been for so many years an expression in which the schools were a sort of duplicate pattern to the factory. And what the product that is being produced is young citizens for the workforce. Um, I want to ask you, what might school look like if it were not a replication of the factory? What might school look like if it were an ecological process? What would we think about doing with our next generation hope for the future of our species if we weren't squishing them into classifications and normalized metrics? How might we provide them with the conditions for learning to be in their world in a way in which we never got to. So here's the big challenge is how to essentially make a place where next generations can learn something that we do not know. Um, I'm attaching a couple of videos to this and one of them is a uh, a, a video on uh, the lifeboat story. And the lifeboat story you may remember from 10th grade is uh, an exercise in ethics. And in this video, I'm asking the question around identity and around recognizing those habits of thought that run so deep that in even thinking about how we might get on a lifeboat together, these ancient, um, informed by eugenics, ideas come into play. They just slip under the door. And what a radical thing it is to reveal them, to think about this in another way. How are we going to do this lifeboat together? Because that, in a way, is the question, isn't it? There's a story that gets told in high school classes and in exercises of trying to sort out ethics. Um, and it's the lifeboat story. And in the lifeboat story, there's a boat. And the boat has, I don't know, 50 empty seats on it. And in the water, there are a hundred drowning people. 
And whoever is given this exercise is given the task of trying to figure out which 50 will live and which 50 will die, will be left in the water. Now, every kid who gets given this exercise knows that there's something terribly wrong with it. And the first thing, of course, that they want to do is change the rules. Why do we have to choose who lives and dies? Can't we figure it out another way? And, of course, that isn't allowed. And the, the facilitator or the teacher says, no, 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 these are the, the rules of this, and you have to figure it out within them. But we know better. The story acts as though those people that are in the water are just numbers and forgets that they are living complex systems, that they have histories and language, they've fallen in love and fallen out of love, that they have read books, that they've built houses, that they've walked on streets around the world, that they've made music, that they've made children. And in other words, if there were in fact bobbing numbers, you could in fact assign various criteria to them, but they're not. They're human beings. So the criteria are very soul-wrenching to create. Should this person be saved because they're old and they have more knowledge or because they're old are they of less use to the society is this young person of more use because they have all this life ahead of them or are they of less use because they don't have the education and experience that the society would need is a sick person more useful or less useful and these are the type of questions and criteria that come out of eugenics. Um, and this, this whole question, the lifeboat story, is actually developed by uh, Garrett Hardin, who wrote The Tragedy of the Commons, who was, in fact, a card-carrying eugenicist. And the type of questions lead us to actually think about the possibility of survival in this pretty horrifying way in which one group of people has the means by which to treat others as units that could live or die. But as human beings, that's insane. Uh, we have so much creativity between us. The complexity and the improvisation, the possibilities are, are infinite, actually, of what we, could, what we could become when we're with each other. Who we learn to be in each moment with another person is not necessarily who we are as individuals but what somebody else brings out in us. So what could the possibilities be? We could tie our clothes together. We could pull people. We could swim. We could take turns. We could find a way to build something out of the furniture. We could, you know, we would do that. We would not simply leave 50 people in the water to die because they didn't meet the criteria. So... It's an example of how a type of question and logic can actually lead us to finding answers that can be the most incredibly violent, vulgar approaches to a situation. And in this moment, this way of parceling out resources or human life is such a loss and such a blind spot to all the possible creativity lurking in our mutual complexity and our mutual learning.
we are complex living beings, each and every one of us made up of centuries, epochs of the communication and conversation and learning of other living organisms. Even my body is filled with hundreds of trillions of organisms. We are transcontextual. And we're living in a transcontextual world. The failure of education right now and the potential future of education are within this possibility of recognizing how this combining of processes is taking place, that that in fact is the education where it has been to separate into various boxes. The next leap is actually the study of how things are coming together. Um, otherwise, what we're looking at is the education system perpetuating the existing systems. And while this might ensure that my children or your children get a degree from a particular university or are gained access to a particular form of employment or study, the long-term broader reaches of that form of education are deadly. If we perceive that the world is broken, how will we produce life together? So how do we think about the way in which all those contexts I mentioned at the beginning of this are forming something that my father called a tautology? Okay, you might remember the word tautology being, you know, when you say the apple is an apple. All right, so it's a redundancy. Um, but in evolutionary terms, the word tautology is held in a slightly different way. And it's a very, very important concept for this subject. Uh, and the idea is this, that all of the the organisms, if you will, or the processes that are taking place in a, in a complex system, a meadow, a school, a society, a family, that all of those organisms are doing what they do so that they can all continue doing what they do. So the earthworm keeps being an earthworm and the bird keeps being a bird and the grass is being a grass and the tree is being a tree and those things keep doing what they're doing because the ecology is contingent upon those relationships continuing. Okay, and in this sense, an ecology is even a tautology. And yet, as you know and I know, an ecology is always evolving. It's actually always changing. So while things are continuing, they're also changing. And this recognition of the word tautology, I think, is, is an important contribution to the possibility of essentially getting unstuck from an intersystemic double, triple, quadruple bind. Um, I have found that the various institutions of our world are actually created in a, creating a kind of interdependency themselves. There is a sort of ecology that holds a tautology that is in our institutional relationships. Uh, and in this way, it's important not to underestimate what it is that is needing to be addressed. Um, this little video that I'm going to play for you now uh, is called It's Fantastic, and it addresses this tautology. 
It's fantastic. Just to witness such a theater of tangled stories is indeed a show to beat all shows. The way each flavor of the stories of this moment have produced their own puzzle, complete with transcontextual overlapping versions, is remarkable, even terrible, but beautiful in its intricacy. It's fantastic. It's everywhere. It's a swirling maze of reiterations, a fugue of seductive cages for epistemology to stir itself into itself. Through one door, it's religions, a tangle of the sacred, the potential for devotion wrapped into a spiral of exclusions and controls, and God is God because of God and God is absolute. Through another door, it's money, and money is real because what is real is defined in terms of money. The buck stops and starts there. Then there's the academy, and what's real is studied because what is studied is real. The research proves the research. The schools are labeling, measuring, and funneling out the next generation into compartments that desensitize the ability to receive information about life. The law is based on ownership, which is based on law. The machines keep telling us we need more machines. The health systems are making people sick and pharma is a lifeline that's laced with lies. Self-help is producing an unhealthy idea of the self and help. Spirituality is full of wordy scripts where only breath, art, and music can offer communion. Words are inadequate. So they point to imagination for a break from the boxes, only to find that imagination is sourcing from the epistemology that produces the boxes, remodeling the models. I might shrug my shoulders, sigh, and think, well, it is what it is. As Korzybski says, it is not what it is, and that is the fantastic part. The perception of any one of these tautologies is forged and patterned into a writhing cluster of habits and language spinning round and round. The thing seen is not the thing. The thing felt is not the thing. Caught in 1,000 traps at the same time, at some point we must admire their magnificent mire. All of the stories are in cahoots even in their contradictions, proving the others in a world of proofs. The education system proves the economic system, proves the political system, proves the culture, proves the health system, proves the religion, proves the parenting of the next generation into the same traps, and around we go, never touching ground. It's fantastic. And all attempts to wiggle it, upturn it, reverse it, or destroy it are thwarted by the momentum. You can't change it because it is what it is. Even though it isn't, it is. What a tragic comedy. A romantic adventure. A fun house of optical illusions. Not fun. It's nothing short of incredible. Now, hold. Hold. Release. Let the anxiety of each failure to make change pile on top of each failure to perceive another way until you can climb on top of them and peek out. Here it is. The slippery stuckness in its redundancy is its continuity. In the continuity is the ever-shifting. In the ball of interlocking snakes of story, is the way out. Fix one story at a time and dig your way deeper into the tangle. You have to dance with them all at once. You have to dance them out of their gripping of each other. I have to dance you out of your embracing me into the stranglehold. You have to dance me out of my idea of who I am when I'm with you. Let me be unpredictable. The stories tell each other. The institutions reflect each other. The traps are not simple locked doors, but rather they fasten one another into a sphere of reconfirmation. They whisper in hissy voices, this is real. 
You are real because I am real. War is human because history has war. Offshore accounts are possible because there is no law to make them impossible because it's possible that offshore accounts rely on impossibility. The market is driven by slave labor because the labor needs the market that enslaves. Shattered mirrors reflecting strange angles of the same crime scene. It takes humor, art, reverence, and irreverence. It takes rigor, practice, stretching the brain. It takes synesthesia, sensing in new ways across senses. It takes warmth, weirdness, and wonder. I feel I'm screaming in space, writing in invisible ink. I can tell you ahead of time that I'm going to seem incoherent, uninformed, irrational. I am an aberration, a nonsense. But that is what change looks like. I mean, seriously, this is why play is vital. The change needed looks unfamiliar, looks nothing like the existing perceptions, looks nothing like what might be called grace or profanity from this vista. You cannot trust yourself to recognize it when it kisses you. We cannot rely on this current vantage point to reveal the change. We cannot see it or name it from here. It is not in existing language. There are no subtitles. It is crickets, wind, light waves, and the call of next year's baby goats. We do not hear it, and when we do, it sounds too strange. So, where is the change? It is everywhere except where we try to make it. The trying and the making of change are contaminated with the familiar scripts and blueprints. Watch the swirl. Try not to be distracted by what is swirling. The tautology is a tautology. It's fantastic. So it's fantastic. And here we are, eight billion of us needing to lifeboat our way to a different future than the one that is coming in fast on the heels of tech, on the heels of ecological upset, on the heels of political divisions, on the heels of a history that has been exploitative, destructive, and has produced vast gaps in the living possibilities of not only human organisms, but thousands of other ones. Education is about learning. And learning has been, I think, overly emphasized as a process of individual development. And what has been overlooked in that is the way in which, in fact, we have always been in mutual learning, always been learning together, not learning the same things, but learning together learning together how to sit in that math class, learning together how to identify the good kid, the bad kid, the teacher, the, the, the world in which algebra class is something of value. We've been learning together how to justify that exploitation. We've been learning together how to continue something that cannot continue. So the colonialness of this, which is not a term I really want to dig too deep into because it's, um, it's, it's probably beyond that. It probably goes beyond the reach of even colonial behavior, but certainly colonial expression of competition and the measuring of the success 
and the measuring of the betterment of one individual over another uh, is lurking. It's lurking in the logic of how a classroom is designed, of what a, a test is, of what it means to graduate, the trauma and the um, the ugliness of even something so accepted as an application to university will one day, I predict, be seen as an abhorrent violence against the very thing that we want to be speaking of, which is learning and learning together. For the last decade, I've been working on something I call warm data, um, which is no time in this video to really describe to you, but it has to do with recognizing how things are combining. What is that way of learning that is not so much held in the individual, but in the way a group is learning together? What sort of assumptions, what sort of logic, what sort of um, aesthetic or tone comes into the way that they are learning because that matters. There's a tone in a classroom. There's a different tone in the hallowed halls of Cambridge University than there is in the community college of Cabrillo outside Santa Cruz. It's a very different tone. Who are you? Who are you gonna be in the world? Who are we together? My sense is that a kind of learning that is not emphasized, is not emphasized on outcome, but rather is emphasizing um, that which we make together uh, is going to have a, a, a sort of a side consequence also of producing a great deal of healing and possibilities that we never could possibly have projected or imagined from any kind of new model or structure or even top-down curriculum decisions. So there we are, rewilding education. Thank you very much.